Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. If there is someone from from Japan, I'm sorry for my voice. I I lost uh, <coughs> I lost it over the uh, the most recent flight I had from Europe to Japan. Uh, this is Lucas Coffier. I'm the project manager of the U Japan Technology Transfer Help Desk. This is webinar number 26. As usual, before uh, introducing the speaker, I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the, the help desk, how to reach us. As you can see from the slide, we have, uh, you, have you can see my email. You can definitely reach out to me uh, as much as you want. You can take a look at the website. We will be launching new features from April 1st, uh, including new opportunities to find data about researchers, clinical trials, uh, patents, and other research-related data, from especially from Europe and also from from Japan, uh, thanks to a collaboration with a, with a startup in uh, in Europe. You also can find the link to uh, the survey. It is recurring about SMEs. So if you're working for an SME, if you are, if you know someone that is working for an SME in Europe, please do share the the link and invite them to uh, to take part to the survey. The last link that you can find is about the, uh, the newsletter. So please do register if you want to hear from us on a regular basis about technologies, about events that we participate to and we uh, speak at. And, uh, and just to touch in general with us. Today, I'm very happy to have a friend. Uh, again, once again, we are uh, working on three time zones uh, from US, from Europe, and from Japan. So it's kind of tough. Here in Japan is 11 p.m., but uh, still, we are here. Uh, so before introducing, uh, giving the floor to, uh, to our speaker, I would like to introduce him with a a short bio, we have today uh, Dr. Encinas Carlos. He is a life science expert resource for commercialization assistance programs. Carlos currently serves as a director for business development and international relations at SkySongs Innovations, which is the technology transfer arm of Arizona State University, ASU. And Carlos is also the founder of several biotechnology companies like Amherstam BioLife Sciences, focusing on utilizing cell culture techniques to develop different projects. He's also involved in the identification, evaluation, commercialization of valuable technologies developed outside of the United States. Carlo has also developed small services companies in different fields, construction and manufacturing, and he previously served as the director of the Cedars Sinai Technology Transfer Office, providing support for the protection and commercialization of intellectual property generated at the medical center as well as promoting collaboration between investigators of at other research institutes and universities, both domestic and foreign. Uh, Carlos has also served several different leadership positions in a variety of technology-based companies, primarily in the life sciences and green technologies realm. His experience includes CFO, COO, CSO, senior management and advisory role for startups in the US, Europe, and South America. Carlos' role is to support mentor, advise early stage and technology based companies around the globe while maintaining a sustainable and clean strategy. Carlos has also a passion for creating and developing international networks and that's how we met. So I'm very happy and honored to introduce you today to Dr. Encinas. Carlos, welcome, good morning, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Luca. I, I appreciate the introduction and your kind words. Um, for those participants, um, you know, I want to uh, let you know that I want this not to be a, a, a seminar, but actually to be a roundtable. So if you have any questions, any comments, just let me know, you know, and stop me there. I know that sometimes it's hard to have a question or comment till the end, so I welcome them at any time that you have. So I appreciate your time, and uh, thank you so much. So let's start. So, you know, the agenda for today, I want to talk a little bit about the historical perspective of why uh, the transfer came about, uh, the issues about establishing a transfer office, I mean, things that we need to consider in a macro setting, 
uh, the general operational models that we use to establish the transfer office, as, as Luca mentioned, I have the uh, pleasure and luxury to have established about 18 different uh, technology transfer units around the world. Um, I want to present to you a case study that uh, demonstrate the need uh, to support technology transfer and, and what's my vision for the future and why we're here and what we, we are planning on doing. Uh, so when it comes down to technology transfer in the past, you know, before 1980, there was a big concern in the United States about competitiveness and innovation. Uh, they felt that uh, the United States was getting behind and they needed to make some changes in the legislation in order to allow that. Before 1980, every university in any research center did not own the technology that were developed through the use of federal funding. The federal government was the one who was owning that technology and less than 5% of those technologies of those uh, intellectual property was commercialized. So uh, because of the concerns of decline in productivity, they decided to make some radical changes. And, uh, and that's how the data lab came about. You know, you can read on the sides, you know, what the data lab. It allows the universities to own the technology. It allows them to commercialize them. It uh, in charge them of making sure that those innovations reach the general public through the market and ensure that those, um, you know, the only, the only demand was that the inventors receive some sort of upside from that licensing. But the most important part is that the, uh, the economist in 2002 designated this act as the most inspired piece of legislation in the United States. Because, as you can see, this little piece of legislation actually enable what you can see over the last 30 years or more has, has been calculated that it has generated in the first 20 years of its enactment about $30 billion in economic activity, generated more than a quarter of a million jobs. It was in charge of putting about 145 FDA approved drugs in the market and it actually promoted and catapulted the United States into the innovation in the world. So that was just a little piece of legislation to provide freedom for those inventions generated from the federal government, from the taxpayers' money, catapult to the United States into the innovation front. And this is the reason why. You know, this is what we call in general terms, we call this the washing machine. You know, it just goes around and round and round at the technology transfer circle. So when you look at the top, when you look at the funding, you know, it goes to research and development. The inventors get the publications. They're really eager to publish, to present, to disseminate. And the industry can get awareness of that, and they can make use of that without a license. But if we just take a little bit of time, and we do the technology assessment, we do some market assessment, we protect it, and then commercialize it, we can actually obtain benefits, which allows still the investigators and the inventors to publish and to disseminate that investigation and that research and those funding, but at the same time we can protect them and we can try to commercialize them and take them into the market. So the two paths are not, uh, are not divorced. We can actually work with them at the same time and make that happen. So what is the impact of technology transfer compared with research? Research is mostly concerned about the creation of knowledge and the advancement of science. We utilize research for teaching, for education, for generating grants and publications. But technology transfer is in charge of societal impact and economic development. We are the ones in charge of creating new startups, creating jobs, creating new industry, and hopefully get those investigators to work directly with industry so that they can develop their own partnership, they can develop their own funding sources, and they can expand this collaboration more and more in order to bring more solutions to real-life problems into the market. Um, obviously, all these advances does not come easy. Most of the research that we do does not end up in a product into the market. There's a huge funnel that happens. We have a huge amount of research expenditures coming to the university. From all of them, only a few fraction of them create any invention. From those inventions, only a few fraction of that 
gets patented because of patenting issues, prior art, or um, market readiness. And from those, only a few of them get licensed and convert them into startups. And even fewer than that makes it into the market. So it is calculated, just so you know, that about less than 2% of all inventions that we develop at the university setting can generate income. What I mean income, I'm talking about maybe $5,000 here, $10,000 there, maybe even twenty. But less than 1% of those inventions generated is going to create real money values, those that I'm talking about, your million dollars that can help support the activities of a university or a, or a research institution. So it is calculated that about 0.7% of those are going to make serial dollars. So, you know, what has been achieved? And again, we see here the funnel developing. Oops, sorry. Um, we have about $809 billion coming into research funding that translate after all these filters, after going through the funnel, we get about 38,000 active license and options. Not all of them get converted into real uh, market solutions or products or services. But most of them, even though they're licensed, they still need further development, but that does not ensure that they're going to make it into the market. And again, supporting the idea that less than 1% are going to create real dollars. And this is coming from the source from Autumn, that it's uh, the Association of University Technology Managers, that is the Tech Transfer Association here in the United States. So the, it is calculated that over the last 15 years or 20 years of operations in tech transfer, we have generated more than, more than $1 trillion in gross industry input more than half of more than 590 billion dollars in gdp and generated more than four million jobs that's the real effect of technology transfer and you have seen those you have seen this economic effect in the products some of the products that you use on a daily basis i can see google over there lyrica juno uh, taxol uh, duolingo and uh, blu-ray some some products that we normally use on a daily basis are there and they are the brainchild of some investigators at a university. So that is the background. That is the reason why we do tech transfer and why we're here. Now, if you allow me, I'm going to talk about the vision of establishing a technology transfer in the macro setting. So what do we need to establish a technology transfer office? So we can, we can uh, succinctly define what we do in three different words. We identify inventions, we protect them, and we commercialize them. That's pretty much the job and the role of a tech transfer unit. What have we experienced? Since its inception, since the Babel Act, we have seen a lot of technologies being brought into the market, but in different, in different models. There's a, there's a model that calls for licensing. If you protect your invention, you provide it to a different player that is going to develop it, is going to market it, and is going to sell it. There's the other market that it comes down that it says, there's another idea that it says, we should develop new startup companies so that this company can truly focus on these technologies and, and develop them. So those are just two school of thought, and the movement and the way universities and the way the tech transfer unit work with it it's actually an appendant of that matter. Sometimes they move 100% of licensing. Sometimes they move 100% of, 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 of creating startup companies. And that pendulum is moving. And I have seen them for several decades that I've been working in the field. So the pendulum behavior you know, that I was talking about, we have seen this around for decades. I have seen this as personal experience from Caltech and UCLA. In Caltech, in the mid-90s, late 90s, sorry, they were just focusing 100% and creating new companies to put the technologies in development. This was driven by economic factors, by social demands to ensure that those technologies and the money that the taxpayers are putting into research reach the market and the social aspect and the social impact that we're looking on there. Also, we have seen at UCLA that they wanted to move the other way around. They wanted to focus 100% of the technology 
in licensing. And again, there's no right or wrong on this approach. It's just a matter of the same way that we diversify a portfolio of investment is the same way that we need to treat and diversify a portfolio of inventions. Now, this pendulum behavior we have also seen on industry. It has been in years past that industry tries to license and commercialize everything and anything that comes out of the university, trying to take advantage of that academic freedom and the uh, great minds that are working in this research and try to exploit and try to make the most out of it. Then the pendulum swings to the other side, and when they try to do everything internal, they try to hire the great minds from the universities, they try to hire the great minds from, um, from academic institutions and try to bring them into this ivory tower that they create solely in 100% to direct them for what kind of research, what kind of product, what kind of service they're looking to satisfy. Uh, the pendulum moves pending on economic development, pending on economical needs, and pending on the market as well. And I have seen this recently happening with Pfizer. I've seen this twice already where Pfizer moves everything internally, then brings it out externally, and now is bringing it out again internally over the last couple of years. So in order for us to really find that middle ground to be able to meet with industry, meet with um, university needs, and be able to commercialize those technologies, we need to find that the pendulums meet somewhere in between. So what are the keys to success of establishing a tech transfer unit? Well, the main point is to develop and be honest with oneself and say, what kind of model do we have? Primarily, we have seen two main models. One is the value-driven, that we're only looking to make money out of the conventions that we develop. And the other one is service-driven. Two of them very valuable, but there's a big difference between the two of them. Value-driven can be very uh, volatile because we do not control what kind of invention we're going to develop, and we do not control what kind of commercialization the companies or the licensees are going to develop. And uh, it can be very successful if, if, if managed well, and it's also very selective on the kind of technology that it's going to, to protect. The service model tries to encompass and protect every single technology that comes in, trying to keep the investigators happy and trying to protect every and all and every single invention that comes to our office. Service-driven can, can, can lead to a lot of happiness in the field, but it's very expensive. And at some point, you know, upper management is going to come back and look for results uh, for what we do. So we need to be careful with that. Uh, we need to define our goals. If we want to make an economic development, that we want to create new jobs, new companies, um, and, and help the development of our local region, or if we're just looking for social impact that is going to bring products into the market that make the world a better place. Uh, we also need to look and become more global and engaging. That's the reason why I'm in charge of this international um, operation at Kaizen Innovation. Uh, we need to network. We never know where the next opportunity is going to come from. And we need to be very collaborative because we never know where our opportunities are going to come, uh, what our next best product, or best next collaboration is going to be found. Uh, well, now, you know, I know you're interested in the operational model, so I'm going to show you just the general um, model that we use in every single tech transfer office that we have seen. Of course, everybody takes their own take on this, everybody adapts it in their own needs, but this is the generalities of what we have seen in most of the tech transfer units, not only in the United States, but elsewhere in the world. As I said before, we have two roads, two options, you know, protect technology or not. And uh, if we choose not to protect the technology, we have seen that industry may take advantage of that. I have a personal experience with a colleague of mine in the Czech Republic that developed a vaccine. I can't quite remember if it was Hep B or Hep C. And uh, when a company came in, can reveal which company, but came in, talk to them, get the data, and offer to take the technology and bring it into the market for a couple of test tubes in this laboratory. And I mean that with a grain of salt. I mean, they provided um, materials and uh, equipment for his laboratory. But in the big scheme of things, it was nothing compared to what the company made for, um, for the use of this technology. And that's the reason why we started expanding operation internationally. So if you get the funds, you spend the funds, you develop the science, 
Um, industry may, may aware of that. They may actually develop and further the risk of technology, make a lot of uh, financial gains out of it, and leave the investigators uh, out of the cold. But if you choose to protect that technology, to have a technology assessment, protect it, market it, license it, commercialize it, you can actually expand those opportunities, gain the support in order to do whatever it is that you want to do as an investigator and develop those technologies, uh, fund your own laboratory. I have experience to work with investigators that no longer file for uh, grant applications. They just do their, uh, their research 100% funded by monies that are flowing in from industry, from uh, licensing opportunities. So, uh, you know, and one of the things that I tell, my, tell to my investigators is that um, you have the freedom to continue presenting. You have the freedom to continue disseminating your investigation. But, uh, you know, just give us one day and we'll be able to protect it uh, thanks to the, uh, uh, to the tool that we have here in the United States that is the, uh, the provisional patent application, something that we can do on, uh, on a short notice. So uh, things to consider for you if you want to come into this market. But anyway, Lo and behold, here's the general tech transfer process that we use in most of the tech transfer units that we have started. It all starts with the idea with the invention. We have to register the invention disclosure to demonstrate that we're actively seeking protection from that particular idea. We do a technology and market assessment. We want to make sure that that invention is actually relevant into the market. Uh, you know, I have numerous uh, examples of technologies that weren't market ready or they even weren't market relevant. But uh, we need to consider each and every one of them with the same seriousness that would take uh, a great invention. You know? So once we do the technology market assessment, we try to develop the, uh, the strategy for what kind of protection we're going to have into the market. Um, with that, once we have the strategy, we pair the inventor with uh, patent, um, patent prosecutors, and it's almost like matchmaking. They need to work as a team, and they need to have certain chemistry in order to work together, and that's the reason why the errors goes back and forth, because sometimes we need to work with several different groups in order to find a perfect match that is gonna work perfectly with investigators, so we can develop and create the best match in order to protect the technology the best way we can. Once the prosecution is going forward, and it takes time, it takes on average about three to four years to get a, a granted patent, but in the meantime, we, we constantly do a technology market assessment to ensure that the technology is still relevant, even though they're still pending in the, in the patent protection process. If the market is not relevant, depending on the model that you use, if it's a service model or if it's a value model, we can return it back to the inventors in that point. But if it's still relevant, we start doing our marketing efforts. We start moving forward. We start reaching out to technology, to, to technology-driven companies. We start our own company, and we find a way to get it into the market. If we find a company that is actually interested in that technology, we start business negotiations, and then hopefully, at some point, we're going to get the royalty influx. And the royalty influx, as I said before, here in the United States, they don't act that helps establish the transfer office demands that we share any proceeds with the inventors. Those proceeds can be well established and can be uh, defined uh, on a university-to-university -university basis. Uh, some universities are more generous than others. Or um, sharing policies here at Arizona State University is 30% to the university, 30% to the inventors, and 30% to the unit or the laboratory that created that invention. So those are general processes. And the most important portion of it that I can say is the marketing effort. So let me talk to you a little bit more about that, the marketing effort. So at Skyson Innovations, our goal is to market 100% of the invention. And this is rarely seen in other, in other tech transfer units. Um, based on their model, they all try to do it 100%, but there's only a few that I can tell you that they do it certainly, that they do market 100% of the technology, something that we do. Uh, most of the tech transfer units, they select 
uh, those that had a better chance to make it into the market, and those are the ones that support the rest of them. But only a few of them get 100% fully marketed. We do that 100%. So once we receive the invention disclosure and we have done the, the IT, the intellectual property assessment, we create a non-confidential summary, and that is shared with more than 4,000 different companies that we have in our roller decks in order to be able to ensure that that technology gets to see what we call the light of day, that it gets feedback, real-life feedback from companies that are actually trying to promote those technologies that are trying to create a service, that are trying to create a product that is going to help the public solve a specific, a specific problem. Then, the other thing that we do, we create a marketing spreadsheet, and we, um, and we publish it in several different websites. We have our own website that we, um, we show those non-confidential summary, and we also do um, you know, some math, email, and documentation sharing with, um, with the roller decks of companies that we have. As I said, we have more than 4,000 different companies, and those 4,000 different companies, uh, mainly, most of them are in life sciences, but uh, we also have, as a university, we also have some other ones that are in the physical sciences. And uh, the fields are getting so narrow that, that sometimes we just share with, with all of them. But, you know, as we talk in the marketing processes, we talk about the pyramid of how everything is being marketed. Everything and every single technology gets marketed as a web and email. So everything is posted on the website. Everything is emailed to our contact. And then only a few of them start being presented directly and targeted uh, to our contacts and our colleagues at different uh, industry events. We say ACTE there because ACTE was the former name of Skype and Innovation. So we haven't corrected the slide, so my apologies. Then we also presented in New Chain Media. We have a very strong presence in the local market with the local community and the media. And then finally, we do targeted marketing with companies. They already understand and we have a very strong relationship and we uh, tailor made those marketing tools for them to help us evaluate and assess the technology. So in general terms, this is the general process. As I said before, we can summarize it in identifying, detecting, and commercializing the technology, but the marketing part of it, the marketing, the, the uh, protecting and commercialization, it's a huge marketing tool that has to be heavily considered and heavily weighed in in order to develop the technology transfer office. So now, uh, the case study that I have in order to demonstrate the need and the importance of a tech transfer unit, and this came from my previous life, as Luca mentioned earlier, from my days at uh, Cedar Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. So I'm going to talk about two technologies and two different processes. The Swan Gantz catheter was developed by Jeremy Swan and, and, and William Gantz in 1968. It was never patented and was developed at Peter Sinai, uh, as, as opposed to the Barat balloon catheter uh, developed by Peter Barat, developed in 1990, patented in 93, and also invented at Peter Sinai. So the first technology is a catheter that pretty much, for those of you who are not in the medical field, they actually help measure the different pressures on the different chambers of the heart. And it's very important for cardiologists to develop that in order to understand where some failures in the heart are actually happening. Now, the Varazalum catheter, it's actually helped uh, shave, for lack of a better word, shave the excess of plaque of adipose uh, deposits that are actually spilled in the, in the arteries. Um, in order to avoid uh, heart um, artery blockage. So it's put it into, into the artery, it shapes that uh, adipose tissue, and the blood flow continues normally. So those two technologies develop at Peter Sinai, one protected, the other one not. So let's see what happens. Swan gas was not patented, no institutional process, and it was sold by the inventors only for $10,000. The medical center received $0. The Barat Balloon catheter was disclosed, protected, that we have institutional process in place, was licensed to the private sector, and through the life of its patent, the medical center received $28 million. You know, this is just the medical center. I'm not talking about the benefit that the uh, PI received uh, for licensing that technology. 
ourselves on the case studies because we don't have data. We were just doing an analysis about how much the inventor could have received for the Swan Scans catheter had it been patented and developed. So as you can see on average, you know, throughout the years of the life of a potential patent, we could have won and received about, on average, about $800,000. So the life of a patent is 20 years. We should have received from the 1960s probably somewhere between 18 to $20 million and million dollars of the 60s, as opposed to the brass uh, uh, cutting balloon that received up to 2005, $33 million total with revenues for the medical centers, about $16 million before the patent expired. So uh, we have two roads, two options, protect or not protect the technology. But if you have your process in place, a patenting is a very good way of going, protecting the science, publishing, and uh, commercializing, and ensuring that your technologies make this world a better place. So this is the best practice. Fund, support R&D, protect it, commercialize it, and make this and make this world a better place. So finally, over the last couple of minutes, I want to talk to you, what's our vision of the future? What's my vision of the future when it comes down to technology transfer? So what we're looking for here is if we look at the past, for the last 60 to 70 years, the economic power has been with the United States. But the world is changing. New ideas and opportunities can be found anywhere in the world. The research and development monopoly found in the United States is no longer here. When you look at the funding that has been received from the NIH and the NSF, it has been flat in the Clinton, the Clinton years, almost 20 years, and it hasn't grown. The educational system, it's in disarray. We need an overhaul. And most of the, most of the people conducting research at the United States years, the economic power has been in the United States. The world is changing. There's flows of ideas coming from any which way. The R&D monopoly in the United States is no longer there. In fact, we're not supporting research as much as we use um, since the, the funding has been flat since for the last 20 years. So we need to do an overhaul on education and develop for, for institutional goals. So. However, you know, the U.S. remains and will remain a key global player over the next few years. You know, I don't know when this is winding down, but uh, it's going to continue to be a very important player. But the global economy continues to evolve. We see different markets emerging. We have different opportunities. And we're going to see that the flux of ideas and funding is going to move in the same way that we see the flux of goods. Um, there's no one player that holds the, that, that holds the economic upper hand. Everything is going to be shared. And um, the technology flow will no longer be just towards the United States. We have seen technology flowing into China, into Southeast Asia, into Europe, and even Latin America. And, uh, and sources of capital are available anywhere in the world. As a, um, as a CEO of several small companies, we have seen investment coming from countries and coming from places that we weren't expecting. So that's going to be an important feature. Uh, we're going to see consolidation. And what I mean by this, what I mean is that the Basel Act that established the transfer offices was a federal demand. If you receive dollars in the United States from the federal government, you must have a technology transfer office, something that is very expensive, something that is difficult to maintain, and that's going to have to drive consolidation between different institutions. Here in the state of Arizona, we're actually seeing this sort of consolidation that is happening between a couple of universities. So we're going to be seeing this, and we're trying to work for it to be ready to promote this consolidation via zone specific or open zone collaboration, where we can have collaborators in different areas in the world to help us commercialize the technology, something that we're doing right now in South America and with partners in Europe. We're going to need to have flexibility when we make deals. For us, making the deal is more important than winning. We don't care about the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the amount. We just want to make sure that our technology reaches out and has an opportunity to reach the market. 
we're looking for networks and our relationships can open opportunities anywhere to ensure that we receive more dollars for research, more dollars for our licenses, and even yours. So our vision, my vision for the future is that we need to develop technology transfer offices with global roots. We need to be engaged around the world. What is happening around the world affects us directly. We need to seek opportunities in every single market around the world, not only for commercialization, but also for investment and funding. We need to embrace a social agenda. Science should be used for the benefit of the community, and we need to look that our products or services reach the market, not only to make ourselves, to support ourselves economically, but to ensure that some diseases get the cure that it needs. We need to be open-minded and open for business. We need to take every single business opportunity seriously, consider it, do our due diligence, and make sure that we're willing to say yes, but not afraid to say no. Sometimes the best decision you can say is the opportunity not taken. So we're willing to say no if we don't see the opportunity. We need to be involved, engaged, responsible. And my last point is constantly improving. I tell my team when we make a license, when we do something great, we celebrate for five minutes, and we need to roll up the sleeve and continue working for one minute. So this is the background, the vision, and I thank you for your time. I thank you. I know it's late. I know it's a, it's a Friday, and I appreciate your attention. And uh, here is my contact information. Is there any way that I can help you? I appreciate your time. Thank you, Carlos. <clears throat> You've been really exhaustive and, uh, and clear <clears throat> i i guess that someone in the audience might might have a question or more than one for you so i would i would probably leave a minute um for the attendees the participants to maybe formulate a question in the meantime i do have a question myself uh i i do have an answer already but i would like to to hear your your opinion uh why do you think, um, in terms of pure uh, amount of uh, revenues of royalties or amounts that are received from from assignments, the U.S. is still probably playing a leading role in in the world? Okay, can you repeat that? I didn't quite understand the question. Yeah, I mean. In terms of tech transfer from especially from universities if you look at the uh, the statistics uh, still US universities are are leading pretty much uh, compared to all the other uh, countries in Europe or even outside of Europe even here in Japan so what do you think is the, the secret sauce the, the secret recipe that makes the transfer offices so profitable compared to uh, their peers outside of the US yeah, no, that, that's that's a really good question, and and I wouldn't say that we're more profitable. I I would say that uh, as I as I if we go back to, to it's, if we go back to the presentation, um, it, it it's all about the model that you decide to do. Right now, if I were to look to present to you to the numbers that we have developed at Skyson Innovation, we have been growing for the last ten years constantly. And one of the things that keeps me awake at night is thinking about what's going to happen when those numbers dwindle, because they will. You know, they will stop. They will stop growing. What are we going to do? So right now, as long as we're growing, people are happy because, you know, we're spending on, on, on innovation, we're spending on patent prosecution, we're doing everything that we need to do in order to ensure that we get what we need to do. But it's a costly, it, it, it's a cost-effective situation. At some point, if we start dwindling, they're going to come back to us and say, "What are you doing?" And they're going to get mad at us, and they're going to demand results, and they're going to demand that we show that every single technology that we have is going to generate income. So, as long as we're growing, people are going to be happy, and they're going to be asking questions. Once we remain flat, that's when the questions are going to come, and that's the reason why we're working and doing everything we can at this moment to ensure that when that time comes, we're ready with income. So we're going to need to move at that moment from a completely 100% service-oriented office 
to a 100% economic driven com uh, a unit. Does that answer your question? So it all depends on the on the side that you're in in the equation. It does. It does. I have another another question uh, for you. How would you educate companies in co in countries where probably licensing, especially from universities, is not that common? to make them understand the value and how to then not just the value of the of the technologies themselves but the value in terms of the dollar value of the technology that they're licensing and therefore they have to be willing to pay for yeah no it's an, another good question look um, uh, we i mean if i said i spend the last 15 years working and traveling around the world just meeting with universities and and, and even governments that were interested in developing their own tech transfer unit and their biggest concern was exactly that that companies are not used to paying for the value that a, that an invention brings to them and uh, you know and it takes time we, you know we need to show them uh, comparables to say well you know the technology is ready to go you can use it or you can leave it here uh, but if you were to develop it on your own, this is how much it's going to cost you. It's going to develop. It's going to take years to develop. You're going to need to have to acquire some very expensive capital equipment. You're going to need to hire very important minds. Take you know, spend time and effort in doing that until we come up with a number that is palatable to them in order to license. But it's going to be. Uh, it, it has been over the last 15 years an uphill battle working with companies who otherwise didn't have the experience that the United States experienced through the Babel Act. Challenging, but not impossible. I mean, we have been able to turn the corner in some countries in the world where they have been able to see that the, the alternative to developing the technology on their own, it's a lot more expensive than, than licensing itself. Um, the big example is, you know, 5% of, um, you know, 95% of something is better than 100% of nothing, you know. And and when you look at the amounts of royalties that we demand and we seek for our partners around the world and, and ourselves, it never goes beyond 5%. So, you know, if you're greedy enough to say that you want 100% of nothing, well, that's, that's on you. But if we can share, if you can share, 5% uh, of your profits, especially based on a specific technology, well, that's great for everybody. Thank you. This is really a uh, really good answer. Uh, I have a very last question, and then probably I will give the floor to the audience if they, if they do have a question. Uh, in your experience at ASU, have you ever uh, had a, a startup company from outside of the U.S. interested in licensing out, in licensing in technologies from you guys. Yeah, I mean that that happens very often, and, and most of the inventors uh, will like to be entrepreneurs as well. And as you can see, sometimes that's not a good recipe for success. But um, at Skyson Innovation, we have an a, a, an office dedicated solely for the development of new companies and to find uh, what we call entrepreneurs in residence, EIR, yeah. that help those inventors to manage their new company. And there's all sorts of incentives for them to actually do it um, if they decided to focus on their technology. Um, again, you know, I, I'm still to find that particular inventor that is also an entrepreneur that can be successful. Uh, they're rare, but when you find them, they can make great companies, and I have experience working with a couple of them uh, in the past and in the present, and it's a pleasure working with them. But when you look at the numbers, when you look at the stats, I will say that for every 10 technologies we license, we have one new startup company. Clear. Excellent. Well, <clears throat> in the meantime, uh, it seems that the audience is pretty uh, satisfied. It means that you have been very clear and exhaustive. 
which is good. So I would just add, like to add that, uh, the, the the presentation that uh, Carlos gave us today, especially. I mean, I'm talking about the file, of course, will be available. So it will be published together with the with the video of the webinar as usual on our YouTube channel on the website of the help desk. And uh, of course, if you want to reach out to uh, to Carlos, you can see his uh, contact details here on this slide, or you can uh, reach out to him uh, through me, and, uh, and you can send me an email. Uh, we are always open, so I would probably close uh, our session today. Thank again a lot, Carlos, for his time, uh, being awake very early in the morning for us, and Eva, of course, in Brussels, and of course, all the participants uh, with us today. And I will see you all in uh, probably, hopefully, in uh, in April with the next webinar. Thank you.